Hi guys. So, as you know, it's the early 1930s. America's been plunged into a Great Depression, and it doesn't really look like President Hoover is going to do a whole lot to try to fix things. So that's where President Franklin Delano Roosevelt comes into play with his new deal. So stick around. That's what we're going to talk about today in class. So, okay, guys. Today, we're going to try to answer this question. We're going to talk about the New Deal, how it fought the Depression. Specifically, we're going to try our best to answer the question, how did the New Deal attempt to solve the problems of the Great Depression? So make sure, grab a pencil, get your paper ready, get some notes out, or get ready to take some notes, pay attention. And by the end of the video, hopefully you've got an answer to this question. So by now, we are firmly in the throes of the Great Depression. Things kind of suck for America right now. It's definitely time for some change. Uh, the people, they were fed up. They were super fed up with President Hoover. He really didn't do a whole lot to help them, if you remember from our previous lesson. And when he did the help, when he did try to help, he provided, uh, the help that he did provide really wasn't much of anything. You could also say the same thing about Congress in general. So Hoover, he's, he's also a really easy target to blame. The president is a very centralized figurehead. People were upset and they were fed up with Hoover, so he was an easy target. Enter the 1932 presidential election and Hoover gets his butt stomped. Hoover lost this election by, at the time, the largest margin in presidential election history. Um, if you take a look at this map here real quick, you can see that when when I say that he lost by a big margin, you know, he really lost by a big margin. It was huge. Um, I believe Herbert Hoover actually won only six states in this election. Most of those states were those hardcore Republican northern states. So, you know, who did Hoover lose this election to? Well, it was a guy named uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, as I'll often refer to him as. And FDR was the cousin of another famous Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt. FDR would go on to get himself elected as president for four terms over four separate elections. This is a record that he is currently, he currently holds and it will never be broken. In fact, it's because of FDR that we now have a two-term limit for our presidents. The main thing that separated FDR from Hoover was that FDR firmly believed in using the power of the government, the power of the federal government to help people out. He was not a laissez-faire kind of guy like the Republicans of the 1920s. Remember, laissez-faire is no government intervention or as limited government intervention as possible. FDR didn't believe in that. He believed in using the power of the government. And in his campaign and his run for the presidency, he promised the American people what he called a new deal. So right from the get-go, FDR gave Americans hope. A very famous line from his very first inaugural address, which is the speech that the president gives when he is inaugurated as president, officially becomes the president. And one famous line is that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. So basically what FDR is telling the American people is that it's really all in our heads. Um, and if we work hard, we can pull ourselves out from this Great Depression. FDR also brought to the table something that not many other presidents up to that point had, his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt. And she basically served as his eyes and ears. As the first lady, she really kind of traveled the United States, finding out exactly what the mood of the country was, what it was that people really wanted, um, what it was that the people really needed. So FDR really relied on his wife to kind of feel out the American people. And Eleanor did a fantastic job at this. FDR also uh, relied incredibly heavily on a group that he called his brain trust. So who exactly was this brain trust? So the brain trust was a group of people that FDR gathered together. He considered them to be, uh, to be the best and the brightest minds in their fields. And he gathered them together and he told them, guys, I need you to come up with as many ideas as you can on how we can try to fix our economy. FDR really didn't care how stupid or silly or inconsequential these plans seemed to be. He said, I want options. Give me a list of options. Give me some plans. And he called all these options his new deal. 
he said, you know, it can it can easily be argued that the first hundred days of FDR's presidency were the most important. FDR took some of these New Deal legislation ideas from his brain trust to Congress. He took it to the Congress. In the first hundred days, Congress passes 15 different New Deal options. And what we start to see is the government starts to expand itself and really kind of stick its fingers into the nation's economy. And it turns out when the government does this, things start to get fixed, problems start to get solved. And people can already see how this new deal that FDR brought to the table, along with his brain trust, has a chance of really helping out. So this idea of the new deal that FDR brings to the table tries to accomplish three goals. They're known as the three R's of the new deal. So goal number one is relief. How can we help the American people now with things like food or housing or jobs, things that they desperately need right now, immediately? The second R is recovery. What can the government do to stimulate the economy? You know, how can the government try to help for the long term and help us actually come out of this depression? And number three, the third R is reform. What can the government do or put in place to prevent a future depression from happening again? So those three R's are kind of what drives the New Deal. So one of the first major things that FDR does as president is he declares a bank, what's called a bank holiday. The government passed one of these New Deal ideas from the Brain Trust, and it was called the Emergency Banking Bill. And this gave the president the power to temporarily close all banks in the United States. And FDR decided to use this power to close those banks for four days. Um, they figured that was enough time for all banks to kind of get their ducks in a row and straighten themselves out, get themselves together. When this was originally presented to the American people, they were a little bit skeptical. They really thought this was an extreme action to take, but it turns out it, it actually really worked. Something else that FDR did that was kind of, um, separated himself from his predecessors, like Hoover, was this idea called the fireside chat. Every so often, FDR, during these fireside chats, would address the country, would address the nation via the radio, and really kind of explained what was happening to let everybody know exactly what he was trying to accomplish with these New Deal ideas that were being thrown out there. So the first fireside chat actually happens after the bank holiday. And he really explained to the American people why he decided to take that action. Uh, he also assured the American people that what he had done had worked and that it was safe for them to put their money back in those banks. And it turns out that the American people listened to these, listened to the fireside chat, and they did. Um, and as they started to put more money back in the banks, guess what? The economy started to improve a little bit. So that bank holiday, um, it was really meant to, to, to address two of the three goals of the New Deal. It was meant to accomplish the goals of relief and recovery. Now, how do we reform the banks so that this doesn't happen again? So two major laws get passed. The first is the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Um, you and I know it today as the FDIC. So it's still around. So if you go to a bank, let's say you go to Wells Fargo, or if you go with your parents, or if you have your own savings account, maybe you have a job and you go and uh, want to deposit your check, there should be a sign that says FDIC at the bank. This is still in existence, and it came about during FDR's term for this reason. So this basically ensured all bank deposits. This is what gave people confidence that it was okay to put money in the banks. So you could deposit money into the bank and you could be guaranteed to always get a certain amount back, even if the bank failed. So this really allowed people some security when it came to what they were doing with their cash. It made them feel better. The second major thing was the Securities and Exchange Commission, or as I like to refer to it as the other SEC. And this really regulated stock markets. The SEC basically controls what happens with the stock market. So if the stock market goes down too quickly, 
Well, the SEC steps in and closes the thing down to try to get people to calm down a little bit. But likewise, if the stock market goes up too fast, uh, way too fast, it can also cap the stock, the stock market to try to prevent anybody from doing anything too dumb. So once the financial sector is kind of, you know, sheared up through legislation like this, FDR dives in head first with his new deal, with this idea that's become known as alphabet soup. The first alphabet soup we're going to look at is the Agricultural Adjustment Act, or the AAA. The AAA basically paid farmers to grow less crops and to kill off excess livestock. This really kind of shocked the American people, but it was designed as a way to kind of make farming more profitable to where farmers could actually survive off of farming. It was designed to really end this whole problem of overproduction and that drop in prices that we talked about the first day of uh, learning about the causes of the Great Depression, remember overproduction? It was designed to address that problem that we saw during the 1920s that really kind of killed the American economy. Initially, this really pissed people off, right? They're, they're telling farmers to kill off excess livestock and to stop growing as much food. And this piece pissed people off because you have all these homeless people that were incredibly hungry, that wanted food, they're starving, right? But this program, even though it looked bad, it turned out that it worked pretty well. Another big alphabet soup, New Deal bit of legislation that got passed to help people out is called the Civilian Conservation Corps, or the CCC. This was a program designed to give young men jobs, basically. They went around the country planting forests, building trails, digging irrigation ditches, fighting forest fires, basically doing all sorts of outdoorsy kinds of jobs. The CCC eventually employed almost 2 million young men. What they could do is they could work these jobs. They were supplied a place to stay and a small paycheck. Some of that paycheck got used to kind of sustain their living situation, you know, pay for where they were staying, pay for the meals that they were getting. But it also was more than enough money, right, to where the, the workers could send home the money that they weren't using. And most of these CCC operations were happening out in the middle of nowhere. So there really wasn't anywhere for these young men to spend their money anyways. So they would send a portion of their paycheck home for their families to help provide for them. Um, another bit of the alphabet soup was the Tennessee Valley Authority, or TVA, something that had a huge impact in East Tennessee. The TVA built a series of dams across the Tennessee River Valley, and these dams were designed to control floods, to generate cheap electricity, and create a lot of jobs for what was arguably had been one of the poorest areas in the country. So these jobs, along with the cheap electricity and the controlled flooding, allowed for other industries to come into the area. It also allowed for farmers to be a little more sustainable when it came to their farming. You know, they didn't have to worry about their crops getting flooded out. The National Recovery Administration, or the NRA, was a program that was put in place to try to establish minimum wages for workers and minimum prices for goods. This program allowed the public to buy more goods and companies could still kind of make a profit. Uh, it also kind of established a code of fair competition within industries. It kept some companies from coming in and just totally undercutting other companies when it came to prices. So this allowed for more businesses to get established and make a profit. And of course, when they would make a profit, workers would see a little bit better salaries. And of course, when, they, when workers had more money, they could go out and buy other goods. And you know how this cycle works, right? We've talked about it a couple times now. The last spoonful of alphabet soup that we need to talk about in this section is the Public Works Administration, or the PWA. And this was a program that built bridges and dams and power plants, government buildings, things like that, all over the country. It created millions upon millions of jobs. It also really helped to improve the infrastructure of the country. This really gets the ball kind of rolling with the economy, right? Now, there's some other Alphabet Soup New Deal programs that we'll talk about later, but these ones we've talked about today 
are what we kind of see in the first couple years of FDR's presidency. And they're really designed mostly to relieve and recover. Reform will come a little bit later, but you know, this really gets the economy kind of jump started. And as you can imagine, this New Deal program that FDR brought to the table was definitely not without any kind of opposition. Conservatives or Republicans really said that what FDR was trying to do was way too much. He went overboard. They said the New Deal made the federal government way too powerful and encroached way too much into the economy and people's lives. But there are also a lot of people that didn't agree with the New Deal that were actually on the on FDR side, the liberals. There are a lot of people that said FDR wasn't doing enough with these New Deal programs. Um, they argued that the poor needed even more direct relief. And some argued that they needed that relief in the form of cash, straight up money. One important figure on the extreme left that thought FDR wasn't doing enough was a gentleman named Father Charles Coughlin. And he was a socialist, a priest, right? A Catholic priest, a socialist, and thought that FDR really wasn't doing enough to help people. He thought that there needed to be even more done. And he used a very popular radio program that he had to really criticize what FDR was doing. He said that he was leaving out, FDR was leaving out a lot of people when it came to this new deal. And so Father Coughlin said that it needed to be spread out evenly amongst all Americans. In fact, he went as far as, as to say that FDR was out hoovering Hoover. And another figure from this extreme left that really didn't think FDR was doing enough was a senator from Louisiana called Huey Long. Uh, Huey Long had this program he called the Share Our Wealth Program. He thought that there should be incredibly high taxes on the wealthy and that, that money should be given directly to the poor. The idea was you kind of give things, you, you even things out when it comes to money. That's what his goal was. In fact, there was a lot of people that really thought this was a great idea. Huey Long had a very powerful following. So a lot of people liked his idea. He had a lot of people that supported him. Unfortunately, before he could kind of make a run at president and try to really put the Share Our Wealth program into place, he winds up being assassinated, right? So what do you need to take away today from this video, from this lesson? So number one, remember that FDR gave America hope, first and foremost. Number two, don't forget the three R's of the New Deal, relief, recovery, and reform. And number three, remember that FDR really was a middle of the road kind of guy. His opposition on, the on, on one side really thought he was doing way too much, right? The conservatives thought he was doing way too much. And then liberals on the left didn't think he was doing enough, right? So there you go, guys, the New Deal, how it fought against the depression. Hopefully you got some great notes. Let me know if you have any questions. I'll make sure to try to help you out.